we are no longer leaders in manufacturing, but a little more startling, we are no longer the leaders in high technology manufacturing. Uh, in terms of global high tech exports of our country, we hit a peak in 1998, uh, capturing about 25% of the market, and since that time, it has been declining steadily. So now it's about 13, 12% of the world market. Y Europe remained roughly constant during this time. Meanwhile, China from 1995 to 2000, this graph goes up to 2008, went from about 6% to 20% of the world market of high-tech manufactured goods. So that's a fact. And in fact, China says quite candidly, and this is, I'm quoting from Premier Wen Jiabao in a talk he gave to the World Economic Forum in 2009, and he said, we should see scientific and technological innovations as an important pillar and make a great effort to develop new industries of strategic importance. Science and technology is a powerful engine of economic growth. We will make China a country of innovation. We will accelerate the development of a low carbon economy and a green economy so as to gain an advantageous position in the international industrial competition. There's a common myth, for example, that China manufactures because it's the low cost cheap manufacturing, and that's how it competes with the United States and the rest of the world. And so if you look at the biggest solar photovoltaic company in China, it's called SunTech, it's not according to the myth. It's founded by uh, someone born in China of Chinese heritage, but he got a PhD uh, in Australia at the University of New South Wales. He's a citizen of Australia. When he said, okay, he and his colleagues developed a new photovoltaic technology. Australia wasn't giving the right signals that they were serious about the right environment to develop this, so he went back to China. But this chief technology officer, who's a professor at University of New South Wales, is also a director of the Center of Excellence for Advanced Silicon Photonics and uh, Photovoltaics. He's now in China. I toured the plant. This company, SunTech, uh, they toured this plant. It was uh, 100 meters by 400 meters and four stories. It was a high-tech modern plant that imports its raw material, its raw crystalline silicon for where? The United States, because energy is cheaper. It adds the technology, the doping, the metallization, all the things that make it into a solar cell in China, and then it's establishing factories around the world to assemble it. So it so what is wrong with this picture? And it's a high-tech automated factory. It's not succeeding because of cheap labor. Not only that, it, uh, it's focused on driving down the manufacturing course, of course, of course, but it's also set the world record for polycrystalline solar efficiency as measured by a German scientific institute, the Fraunhofer Institute, of 16.5%. So it's low cost and it's actually good technology. Okay, now, rest easy, the United States still has the record for monocrystalline silicon technology in the world. It's 24, 25%, um, but uh, you know, this, is, this is the threat that I see. It now holds the record for the highest speed high-speed rail in the world. Uh, the record's 262 miles an hour, but the operational speed, the schedule speed, is 220 miles an hour. And it has plans for 5,600 miles of new high-speed rail. By comparison, Japan has 1,500 miles. France has 1,100 miles. U.S., zero. China believes that we'll achieve, by 2020, 18% of its energy by renewable energies. Um, and, and according to uh, the Vice Chairman of China's National Development and Reform Commission, the NDRC in China, it thinks it probably will get to 20% by 2020, renewable energy in China.
Well, among the new majority, Republican majority in the House are several um, fairly vocal climate change skeptics. Um, given the increasingly vocal voices on the climate change debate and criticism of climate change science, do you anticipate that you will be going back to fighting the climate change debate itself rather than pushing for solutions to it? Well, well, I hope not. I, I think um, that if anything over the last half dozen years the evidence has gotten more compelling. But the issue, because I think sometimes you get a little bit sideways on this debate if you say, have you proven with 100 percent certainty that this is happening and some bad things as you, what you say, what the climate scientists are saying are happening. And I, I maintain you don't need 100 percent certainty. You know, 80, 90 percent uh, and maybe of half the bad things that happen with 80 or 90 percent certainty is enough to say, okay, how do you want to plant your personal life? Let me use this as an analogy. You just bought a home, electrician comes in and says, you know, the wiring's shot. It's frayed. You've got to replace the wiring. It's going to cost how much is it going to cost? Fifteen thousand dollars. Well, you're strapped. You just bought the house. How can you replace the wiring for fifteen thousand dollars? So what do you do? You get another estimate. Okay, another estimate. I, you know, I said, well, I don't know, but the next new electrician says you got to do it because it's going to be bad if you don't. Okay, do you shop around for the one in a thousand electricians who say it's okay? Not really. Do you, do, you, uh, do you actually go and you say, well, okay, that's a threat, but I think it's more cost effective. I just make sure my fire insurance is up to date. You know, your family's living in the home. It could burn down while they're asleep. You bite the bullet and say, I'm going to do this. Okay? But it isn't even that. And what I'm trying to tell the American public is that this is an economic opportunity, so it's not even though you're, 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 you have to make this ex expenditure, you're making uh, an expenditure because in the long run for the future, future economic health of the country, and that future is not 20 years in the future, we're talking one, two, three years, you've got to make these investments. And this has occurred before. You know, I mentioned the Wright brothers. They made the first plane. But very quickly after that, the airplane technology migrated to Europe. And by World War I, Europe actually had the dominant airplane technology. And most of our World War, all of our World War aces uh, flew planes made in France. And so in 1915, the US government established the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, as it turns out to be a NASA predecessor, to conduct cutting edge research and to encourage the avionics industry in the U.S. And that in part led to a resurgence back to the United States of recapturing the lead. Now um, many aircraft companies, commercially it's now Boeing, but of course now we're uh, in a race with Airbus. Um, other countries think they too can get into this game, including China. We are not interested in funding incremental work. We're interested in game changing work. Uh, the example I gave you before, an electric battery that would th be three to five times lower in cost than today's lithium battery, it's actually taken off from what is called a zinc air battery that are used in people's hearing aids today. But can you make this thing rechargeable, last a lot longer, using whatever combination of metals and oxides? And we think that it has a very distinct possibility of giving cars that now have a 100-mile range 500 mile range at a third the cost.